So the first slide contains a summary of what is going to be in the release. And on the day that we announced this, there was a very nice tweet by David Hawk that this uh, table is breaking my brain. And um, I think this this really conveys the, the, that, that the community will be quite um, surprised, maybe even shocked by uh, how much uh, we are going to put out uh, compared to data release uh, one. Um, so in particular, of course, uh, we jump uh, we, we jumped in, the, in data release one from 100,000 parallaxes with Hipparchos to 2 million in uh, TIGAS. And now we go to 1.3 billion or even uh, more parallaxes and proper motions. Uh, so that's, that's a very major step up uh, in terms of the uh, astrometry. So slide number three shows uh, a, a very brief summary of the uh, gain in astrometric performance by looking at the parallax errors as a function of the brightness of stars. Uh, and what you see in here is the, uh, is the performance of Gaia DR1, that's the, uh, the, the shaded uh, area uh, where uh, one is limited, of course, to stars brighter than about magnitude 12 to 13. And the parallax errors were uh, on average about uh, 0.3 milli arc seconds going up to one. Um, and then the dots uh, show the performance that we uh, currently achieve with data release two. So first of all, of course, we see that uh, we go out with parallax measurements all the way to the survey uh, limit. Uh, and even at very faint magnitudes, uh, we're already achieving uh, sub milli arc second uh, accuracies. Um, and what one can also notice is that although we gained a lot at the bright end, a factor of maybe five to, to 20 compared to uh, data release one, um, it's still uh, dominated by calibration uh, uh, systematics and there's, there's, uh, that means that there's quite a lot of work left to do to take the next step of improvement uh, when we go towards uh, Gaia DR3. But I think this plot shows really uh, a dramatic expansion of, uh, of our, um, uh, the availability of high accuracy astrometric data um, for our Milky Way. Uh, and the line incidentally shows the prediction for uh, a five-year mission. Um, and this uh, it, it coincides almost with some of the uh, uh, dots for DR2 at the faint end. And that is probably because we have maybe been a little bit uh, pessimistic with the um, uh, assessment of the effect of stray light on, uh, on the performance at the faint end. Um, so this uh, shows the uh, photometric errors as a function of, uh, of magnitude, and uh, this is based on stars that uh, have at least 100 or around 100 CCD measurements, and you see the actual scatter in the observation. So this is a good uh, representation of the actual errors being achieved in the photometry. Um, and there are uh, a number of lines in there. The purple one shows the uh, performance that was achieved for data release one. So we can see uh, substantial improvements at the bright end. In particular, a lot of the nasty calibration features have been, uh, have been diminished a lot. Uh, while at the faint end, uh, the, uh, the improvement is also uh, clearly uh, visible. Um, and there again, you see a little bit of the effects of the, of the stray light on the, on the performance. Um, then this is this is for the uh, G-band uh, photometry, and of course the uh, important addition in this uh, particular release is that we have also broadband photometry in the blue and in the red, for which you see the performances here. Um, these uh, performances uh, have been already um, uh, achieved basically for data release one. We didn't put them out uh, at the time. Um, and there's a little bit of improvement because of the increase uh, in data. But again, the main, the main point is that we now have for all the sources in the catalog, or almost all the sources, uh, we have colors uh, available allowing us to characterize those, uh, those stars. This uh, big uh, improvement in terms of photometry is visually illustrated on slide six, where you can see a map of the galaxy where the pixels are coded not by the number of stars, but by their average color. Um, and it beautifully outlines all the uh, dust uh, structures in the Milky Way plane, which tend to be on average uh, redder uh, in color because of the uh, effects of dust extinction and reddening. And of course, at higher latitudes, the colors are, are bluer because we have less extinction uh, and one is looking out into the uh, halo of the galaxy. Um, but uh, this, this, this was used already as an image of the week uh, a while ago, but it really uh, gives in one shot uh, this, this nice overview of the fact that we now have uh, colors and homogeneous colors um, all over the sky. 
Then uh, we switch to the radio velocities uh, determined with the uh, onboard uh, spectrograph. Uh, you see here two images on the left. Uh, this is on slide seven. You see uh, an image of the radio velocity uh, source count. So basically, uh, which stars, uh, the, the number of stars per, per uh, square degree for which we have a radio velocity with an obvious concentration towards the uh, Milky Way uh, plane. Um, and you also see some uh, small uh, artifacts near the Milky Way plane, which looks like the edges of uh, photographic plates. And these are an imprint of the fact that the uh, startup of the processing for the radio velocity still relied on our initial Gaia source list uh, in order to make predictions for the magnitudes of the stars and then select the brightest uh, ones that way. Um, and, and this leads to this imprint of the, uh, of the uh, plate uh, boundaries. And this will be smoothed out in future data releases when we don't depend so, uh, on the IGSL anymore. Okay, on the right, you see uh, an image of the number of times that the sky was uh, scanned uh, or number of times that spectra were taken uh, in each position of the sky with obviously a very uh, strong imprint of the uh, Gaia scanning law. Um, and also uh, an imprint of the fact that the, they demanded a certain minimum number of uh, observations per star in order to derive a uh, radio velocity. But this gives an impression of how the radio velocity precision will vary as a function uh, of position on the sky. So the next slide shows uh, a, a summary of the performance that is achieved with the, uh, with the radio velocity uh, uh, catalog that we're putting out. Um, so the uh, panel on the left uh, shows the uh, a measure for the accuracy that we achieve, and this is done by comparing the radio velocities that we derive with radio velocities that were derived in other surveys, uh, all of them uh, ground-based. Uh, and one can see that in general the agreement uh, is very good, uh, of the order of a few hundred meters uh, per second. Uh, and there is a slight trend towards um, uh, fainter magnitudes where there is more disagreement between our results and uh, the other uh, surveys. Um, this could be uh, uh, indicative of problems in either uh, our survey or, uh, or the ground-based surveys, um, but the fact that you see a consistent trend uh, could hint at uh, a first sign that the, uh, what the effect of radiation damage is uh, starting to kick in uh, at, uh, at the fainter magnitudes in RVS. We were not sure of that, we're still uh, investigating this, uh, but the bottom line is that by and large the agreement between RVS uh, uh, radio velocities and those from other surveys is, is, is very good. And then on the, on the right is a measure of the precision that we achieve and it's uh, divided up according to the temperature of the stars, so according to spectral types. And so for cooler stars, which are the blue and the, and the orange curves, uh, we, we expect uh, better performance and there we reach uh, below half a kilometer per second or so at the bright end. And even for the uh, slightly hotter stars, this is, uh, this is achieved, which means that already at this stage, at the first release of radio velocity data, we are well below uh, what was required in terms of performance uh, before the launch uh, of, uh, of Gaia. And towards the faint end, the uh, accuracies uh, go up to uh, a few uh, kilometers, uh, one to two kilometers uh, per second. Uh, so this this means that the six million or seven million or so radio velocities that we put out are really uh, very, very um, accurate and can lead to exquisite uh, kinematic studies. Then uh, we switch to uh, the variable stars. And these are four maps of examples of the types of variable stars that we have in the Gaia catalog. So the variable star processing is done basically in two steps. In the first step, they make a classification of, uh, of all stars in the sky that have been observed uh, sufficiently often. So they try to decide based on the, uh, on the points in the light curve, whether it's an Aralairi or Cepheid, long period variable, or, uh, and, and another example shown here are the Delta Scuti and Essex Phoenicis variables. These are non-radial uh, pulsators. Um, and subsequent to, the, uh, to this classification, uh, a subset of these variable stars undergoes a specialized treatment, making use of the fact that if you know that it's something is an Aralairi or a Cephi, that you can start deriving things uh, about the star, like uh, the, the, the periods, uh, the, um, uh, uh, etc. Well, you'll have to ask the variable star specialists to, uh, to explain a bit more about that. But they all receive a specialized treatment, and uh, but that's not done for all the uh, half a million variable stars, but for uh, a good fraction of that. 
Now the maps show the distribution of the uh, RLI stars uh, over the sky, uh, or of the variable stars over the sky, and on the top left you see the distribution of RLI. Um, and these are uh, rather old stars, so they are spread uh, basically all over the uh, Milky Way volume, in particular also in the halo. But of course, uh, the, the dominant uh, fraction is in the disk again, and in the large and small Magellan cloud. But what is also very nicely seen is something sticking out of the uh, central region of the Milky Way towards the, towards the, the bottom. Um, and that is basically the Sagittarius uh, dwarf galaxy, which is being torn apart in the tidal field of the, uh, of the Milky Way. And it's very prominently visible now in these uh, RLI stars. You can, in fact, also see it on the bottom in the uh, sky distribution for long period variables. These are typically a bit younger than RLI and therefore they are more concentrated towards the uh, galactic uh, plane. Uh, but again, you see this uh, Sagittarius dwarf uh, sticking out. And then on the, on the right, uh, you see the uh, Cepheids that were, uh, or stars that were classified as Cepheids. These would, would be expected to be uh, largely confined to the uh, galactic plane uh, and also a bit nearer because of their uh, blue colors. So the ones that are far away suffer a bit from extinction. And then at the bottom, you see the distribution all over the sky of these uh, Delta Scuti uh, and Essex Venetis uh, vari pulsating variables. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large catalog, half a million uh, variable stars, and it's, uh, it's really, uh, again, it's an all-sky uh, survey, something that is not normally uh, achieved from the ground. Uh, and this is really the power of Gaia, that you can uh, visit every corner of the Milky Way, as it were, in order to do astronomy. And these are examples of uh, what I just mentioned, that in a second step, uh, you do a more specialized uh, treatment of the, uh, of the variable stars. Um, and this is, again, the uh, distribution uh, over, the, over the sky, which is slightly different from the one based on the, just the classification uh, from the light curve. And uh, this here is an example uh, of, uh, of data put out by, uh, by our astrophysical parameterization pipeline, namely the uh, extinctions towards uh, stars. Um, and this extinction map um, uh, is, is very nicely, I mean, very nicely corresponds to what one usually sees in maps made, for example, with Planck or in the infrared, etc., beautifully outlining all the uh, well-known uh, dust and gas uh, features in the plane uh, of the Milky Way. I um, should say here that uh, this map is uh, obviously, uh, as, as can will, will be recognized by many astronomers, is reliable. So as, a, as statistically, the extinctions are good, but uh, uh, from one star to the other, the, the extinctions can be, can be quite uh, off. It's something that people have to be uh, aware of when analyzing uh, these, uh, these data, and uh, we will provide some guidance on how to do that. Okay, these are uh, examples of um, HR diagrams uh, made on the basis of the uh, luminosities and effective temperatures that were uh, derived for the stars uh, based only on Gaia data, so combining the parallaxes and the uh, proper motions. So the top uh, diagrams show for uh, basically the galactic uh, plane and uh, regions outside the galactic plane, the luminosity versus effective temperature. Um, uh, where you see still uh, many artifacts that have to do with the fact that this is uh, a first uh, attempt based on very uh, limited uh, data only. Uh, and this will be uh, much improved in future releases when we can actually analyze the uh, full prism spectra instead of only the integrated uh, broadband photometry. Um, and the uh, plots on the, on the bottom uh, show uh, the, uh, again, luminosity, but then uh, versus color where the color has been uh, corrected, in fact, for the uh, effects of extinction as determined also by within our own uh, uh, processing pipelines. And then uh, finally on slide 13, uh, we get to the uh, solar system objects. Um, as I said uh, before, this is the best survey ever in the optical uh, for solar system uh, of solar system object astrometry. Um, and you see on the top uh, right a diagram that shows a histogram of the, of the number of solar system objects observed as a function of the semi-major axis of their orbit. So most of the asteroids observed are in the uh, main belt, that's sort of the central peak. Um, but then uh, we also observe quite a few near-Earth uh, asteroids, uh, very interesting of course uh, because of the hazards that they uh, potentially pose. 
and there is one uh, Kuiper belt object, uh, Make Make, all the way over on the on the on the right in this uh, in this diagram. The uh, top left uh, diagram shows the distribution of the uh, of, of the number of times that asteroids have been observed. Uh, of course, all uh, concentrated towards the ecliptic, which is where you find most asteroids. And these um, uh, dark bands that you see running uh, perpendicular to the ecliptic are places where Gaia has scanned more often over these first two years of the mission on which this data is based uh, than in other places. And this will be a, bit of, a little bit more uniform uh, in, uh, in future releases. And then um, on the bottom left, you see a, a diagram that shows the uh, residuals of uh, at, at, uh, with respect to a, uh, to a model fit. Uh, of the CCD level positions, and these are all at the bright end uh, at, at the level of, uh, of milli arc seconds. So again, illustrating that also for asteroids, the astrometry is extremely precise. And keep in mind, these are individual uh, CCD measurements. So these have not, uh, for, not like for stars, been combined into a single uh, parallax and proper motion. But these are these are the, the raw, um, well, not raw, but the uh, measurements as they as they come in. And therefore, you get uh, somewhat larger um, errors, but it, but it has to be kept in mind that this is really exquisite astrometry compared to other uh, optical surveys of, uh, of asteroids. What makes this release so spectacular is the enormous expansion in the amount of high precision uh, astrometry that we have available. So making uh, it possible to study much larger volumes uh, of the Milky Way with high uh, precision but also the combination with the colors and the radial velocities, uh, the, the fact that we have lots of stars for which we have at least an estimate of their astrophysical parameters, uh, makes for, for an incredibly rich uh, data set. Um, and in particular, things like the uh, if, if you look at the kinematic maps that were produced uh, without any very deep analysis or the uh, HR diagrams, you basically see fine structure everywhere. Uh, fine structure in the kinematic maps in the HR diagrams, and this means that we can learn a lot, a lot more about the uh, physics of the Milky Way, but also of stars uh, themselves. And we should not forget the, uh, the, 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 of course, the, the large catalog of variable stars uh, being put out now. Again, homogeneous treatment all over the sky, um, and the same holds for the uh, for the solar system objects. I, I think in solar system astron astronomy, Gaia will actually have quite a big uh, impact. And we'll get a first taste of that uh, with this uh, with this release.